So, it's been a while. Since my last episode, Trump was impeached and acquitted, Epstein was jailed and allegedly died, I don't believe it, cops killed like 500 people, believe it or not, the 5G dragnet started launching satellites and propaganda campaigns, Potential war was instigated when Trump illegally assassinated an Iranian leader, leading to a unified Iraq and Iran, and the whole world is at threat because of China's novel coronavirus. Basically, we're still fucked, in the same way we were for years, and the same way we will be as long as this state persists. Still, I drop the ball. In more than one way, by not only not making episodes, but continually saying I would before I didn't. Someone could probably make a compilation of that. For that, I apologize. Truly inexcusable. In my personal life, I moved to a new place and have been making YouTube videos. But also, my primary PC broke and I have a fundraiser for a new one. Both technical limitations and limitations of budget and location stopped a lot of my progress a while back, but I slowly built back up the steam I lost. So, if you're still here, thank you. The world's on fire, and I'm about to point out the flames. So if you have an hour or so, or an app that speeds this jazz up, feel free to find out how unfree you are. They're demons to hunt. It's good to be back. Now, for those of you who haven't been subscribed to me on YouTube, that track is Boo by Phil Zio. Uh, he made that track custom for what I do, so feel free to give him your business if you want uh, to give him some cool work. He, uh, he provided it for free for me. He'll probably not do that for you, but um, <laughs> he, uh, he, he does good work, and he said he wanted to do something cool for once. He said that he doesn't normally get the chance to make shit like this. So I'm very grateful to him for that. That's been going in a lot of my content, so I'm going to be featuring that twice today instead of once. Uh, if you have anarchist music you want featured in my content, feel free to hit me up and we can talk. All that being said, before we get into the domestic news and the clusterfuck of the coronavirus that is basically Resident Evil in real life, Let's hit this week's piece of good news. It is what I would have said if there was one. Seriously, I didn't even see one piece of good news all week. And I tried. I thought, you know, if I'm coming back, I need a good news section. And I legit couldn't find any. 
Y'all are free to hit me up with good news during the week to prevent this happening again, or bad news you want to make sure I cover. All that said, let's hit this. To get started, let's hit something lightish. It turns out Apple was intentionally fucking slowing down older devices to get people to buy newer jazz. A French anti-fraud watchdog called roughly in English the Directorate General for Competition Consumption and Fraud Prevention said they, quote, committed the crime of deceptive commercial practice by omission and fined them 25 million euros. 25 million euros. Basically a slap on the wrist, nothing but roughly $27 million dollars and ordered them to put a notice about their fine on their French site for a month. They're not changing, though. From Truth Theory, quote, Now that everything is out in the open, Apple still slows down their old phones for the same reasons they described in their initial defense. However, they promise that this should get less noticeable as the technology advances. You can find all the links to all the sources I use in my show notes on jeremiahharding.com. And while that corporation is actively screwing you, another is affecting poor people's ability to get health care. Experian is pushing tech that monitors a patient's credit score and decides on their level of care based on that. For Mass Private Eye, quote, 3,100 hospitals and healthcare systems are now giving patients a secret credit score before they're seen or treated. It goes on to say, Experian likes to use superfluous words to hide the fact that their system determines who will receive medical care. Quote, Using comprehensive data and advanced analytics, our patient financial clearance solution makes the payment process a positive one by assessing and assigning each patient to the appropriate financial pathway based on their unique financial situation. Quote, Comprehensive data and advanced analytics makes the payment process a positive one is just corporate jargon for using data mining to determine if a patient is a good credit risk. Unquote. So you better pay off your slow iPhone or you might not get health care. Good stuff, right? Well, it gets fucking better. The state of Kansas is actively jailing people for not paying medical bills on time. Matt Agarist at the Free Thought Project said, quote, Welcome to Coffeeville, Kansas, where the judge has no law degree, debt collectors get a cut of the bail, and Americans are watching their lives and liberty disappear in the pursuit of medical debt collection. I encourage you to read the rest. It's harrowing what's happening, and it could happen to you. So, who else is going to jail? Unlicensed contractors, 118 of them. Florida's Hillsborough County sheriffs felt super important doing a, quote, sting operation, wherein they essentially employed entrapment to push people into doing work, which legally requires begging the state to do without the begging part. From Reason Magazine, quote, the sting, according to Patch, saw sheriff's deputies pose as homeowners seeking handymen on social media to do jobs that required licensure. These unexpecting handymen would be lured into one of five homes, where undercover deputies filmed them performing or agreeing to perform prohibited tasks like painting or installing recess lighting. They continued, quote, only eight of the people arrested as part of Operation House Hunters. You know, I just gotta stop reading for a second and say that that's fucking pathetic and super Karen and super boomery. But all of that aside, um, Operation House Hunters were repeat offenders, according to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department. The other 110 were arrested for first-time offenses. The bulk of those charges were for, quote, unlawful acts in the capacity of a contractor or a misdemeanor offense that can come with a $1,000 fine and 12-month jail sentence. Repeat violations can result in a felony charge. Yeah, you get those, uh, tile workers. Society is saved. Uh, speaking of sweeping frivolous bullshit... Let's talk about a report the EFF calls damning. 
going over the fact that automatic license plate readers represent an unnerving facet of surveillance tyranny. From EFF, quote, The auditor raised a long list of concerns, including fundamental problems with police policies, failure to conduct audits, and the risk of ALPR data being abused to surveil political rallies or target immigrant populations. In addition to Los Angeles, the auditor investigated the Fresno Police Department, Sacramento County Sheriff's Office, and Marin County Sheriff's Office. The auditor indicated that the problems are likely prevalent across 230 California law enforcement agencies using ALPRs. The report is, in fact, a damning assessment of how California law enforcement agencies are using this mass surveillance technology, which employs computer-controlled high-speed cameras mounted on streetlights on top of police cars or speed monitoring trailers that automatically capture images of every vehicle it drives by without driver's knowledge or permission. The cameras capture the exact time and place a license plate was seen and often compares that data point to hot lists of, quote, people of interest to police. The cameras are capable of capturing millions of data points, which, taken in the aggregate, can paint an intimate portrait of a driver's life and even chill First Amendment protected activity. And there's more. Read it. It's actually terrible. So, while they serialize and track you like merchandise in Cali, you can leave, right? Well, not so fast. States share data captured by police cams, and they want everyone to jump in on the jive. From Mass Private Eye, quote, An article in the Baltimore Sun revealed that the Baltimore County Council wants more businesses and homeowners to purchase CCTV surveillance equipment. Quote, the bill would create a voluntary private security camera registry for property owners with devices pointed toward a public right-of-way, according to the proposal. The program would map where cameras are located to help detectives identify possible security footage in areas where crimes happened. How do cities and towns expand police cam share programs? By offering to waive permitting fees. That's how. It goes on to say the program is used elsewhere by creating a, quote, security camera registry and mapping, or SCRAM, to do similar stuff. So there you have it. You have to beg for permission to do things, but you can get a discount on your begging if you help monitor and control everyone else. What a society. Oh, and check my channel for another expose on surveillance tech used by Leo's. Clearview. It's a doozy. And perhaps a fitting follow-up to that story is this piece on The Mind Unleashed about how the U.S. National Counterintelligence and Security Center are comparing leakers and activists to terrorists like ISIS. A document signed by Trump laid out their mind frame. Quote, The number of actors targeting the United States is growing. Russia and China operate globally use all instruments of national power to target the United States and have a broad range of sophisticated intelligence capabilities. Other state adversaries such as Cuba, Iran, and North Korea, non-state actors such as Lebanese Hezbollah, ISIS, and Al-Qaeda, as well as transnational criminal organizations and ideologically motivated entities such as hacktivists, leaktivists, and public disclosure organizations also pose significant threats. Additionally, foreign nationals with no formal ties to foreign intelligence services steal sensitive data and intellectual property. Unquote. The Mind Unleashed expanded on this document by citing Mike Pompeo. Quote, those same words echoed by former CIA director and current Secretary of State Mike Pompeo during the same year. Quote, It's time to call out WikiLeaks for what it really is, a non-state, hostile intelligence service, often abetted by state actors like Russia. Unquote. Pompeo said at the time, the NCSC argues that leaks, quote, open new opportunities for adversaries to use information as a strategic resource in achieving their economic security aims and exert leverage over their competitors, unquote. The report also insinuates that, 
quote, emerging technologies like AI encryption and the Internet of Things will benefit the U.S. adversaries more than the U.S., unquote. That section of the report said that, quote, threat actors have an increasingly sophisticated set of intelligence capabilities at their disposal and are employing them in new ways to target the United States. The global availability of technologies with intelligence applications, such as biometric devices, unmanned systems, high-resolution imagery, enhanced technical surveillance equipment, advanced encryption and big data analytics, and the unauthorized disclosures of U.S. cyber tools have enabled a wider range of actors to obtain sophisticated intelligence capabilities previously possessed only by well-financed intelligence services. These technologies have opened up new opportunities for adversaries to use information as strategic resource in achieving their economic security aims and exert leverage over their competitors. Unquote. So guess the fuck what? They're angry that informational security is becoming decentralized and distributed. They only want the rich and powerful to have it. Get your wraps soon, might be regulation coming down, Pike. The message is loud and clear. They get all the fancy surveillance tech they want, but if you try to have some of your own, especially the same stuff they use, you might as well be ISIS. So get on Keybase and Wicker if you're a terrorist like me. Oh, and speaking of cybercrime, an Israeli tech firm with close ties to the Israeli government and connected to Jeffrey Epstein just opened two massive cybersecurity centers in New York. For more info, let's consult two great pieces from Mint Press News. The first one goes over how the mega group, an Israeli philanthropist guild heavily tied to organized crime, is partially funding U.S. ventures. The first piece I linked goes over Leslie Wexner, ethno-philanthropist and patron of Epstein, Mossad Assets, Robert Maxwell, and Mark Rich. By the way, Robert is the father of Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, just thought I'd mention that. Reaganite and friend of Trump, Ronald Lauder, Roy Cohn, who helped Reagan get in and now advises Trump, and more. And how all of this was behind some very nasty organized crime, not the least of which was the Epstein scandal. The piece highlights why they're called the Mega Group Mafia, because for many years now they've puppeteered much of the private and public sector crime and been a practical issuer of policy for much of the U.S. government. That piece was written August of last year. So, fast forward to now, Mint Press writes, Early last week, the city of New York launched, with little media scrutiny, one of two new massive cybersecurity centers that will be run by private Israeli firms with close ties to Israel's government, the so-called Mega Group. Tied to Jeffrey Epstein scandal and prominent pro-Israel lobby organizations operating in the United States. The centers were first announced in 2018, as was the identity of the firms who would run them. Israel-based Jerusalem Venture Partners, and SOSA. As Mint Press has reported on several occasions, all three of these entities have a history of aggressively spying on the U.S., federal government, and or blackmailing top American politicians, raising concerns regarding why these companies were chosen to run the new centers in the heart of Manhattan. The news also comes as Israeli... Cybersecurity companies tied to Israeli military intelligence unit 8200 were revealed to have access to the U.S. government's most classified systems and simulating the cancellation of the upcoming 2020 presidential election. The new cybersecurity centers are part of a new New York City public-private partnership called Cyber NYC that is valued at over $100 million dollars and officially aims to, quote, spur the creation of 10,000 cybersecurity jobs and make New York City a global leader in cyber innovation. Cyber NYC is an initiative of New York City's Economic Development Corporation. However, the companies that will be responsible for creating those cybersecurity jobs will benefit foreign companies, namely Israeli 
and most of the jobs to be created will go to the foreigners as well, as media reports on the partnership have quietly noted. Those reports also stated that, while the purpose of the centers is to create new jobs, the Israeli firms chose to run them, Jerusalem Venture Partners and Sosa, view it as an opportunity to provide Israeli cybersecurity companies with a foothold into the American market, and to see Israeli cybersecurity products adopted by both small and medium-sized American businesses, not just large corporations and government agencies. Unquote. The piece goes on to say that while the center is going to create jobs, the primary benefactors will be Israelis, and it also states that a huge connection will be a direct link to the Israeli government. I hope you go to my site and check these sources, especially since I scratched the surface with the amount I include. These articles are extremely in-depth, and there you have it. An Israeli intelligence organization with ties to organized crime, which has been influencing U.S. policy for years, is building New York City's cybersecurity infrastructure. And worse, $30 million has already been looted from New York in the form of taxes to build it. What could go wrong? Not like people connected to Epstein are still on some shady shit, despite him allegedly being dead. Oh, oh wait, they are. From Zero Hedge, quote, Estate records reveal that millions of dollars were transferred from the estate of the late pedophile Jeffrey Epstein in a secretive bank he established in the Virgin Islands six years ago, according to the New York Times. The bank, Southern Country International, was one of the territory's first international banking entities and was only authorized to conduct business with offshore clients. The Times notes that its 2014 approval was unusual, given that Epstein was a convicted sex offender by that time. After Epstein's death last August in a Manhattan jail cell, $15.5 million was transferred to the bank from his estate in December. $2.6 million was then transferred back to the estate, leaving $12.9 million in the mysterious bank. Two weeks later, all but $499,759 had vanished. According to Virgin Islands Magistrate Judge Carolyn Hernan Purcell, there's no explanation for why Southern Country would be receiving checks from the estate. So, like, nothing to see here. Move along, sir. And while you move along, also be sure to use tax dollars to silence journalists critical of Israel. That's why the U.S. state of Georgia uses anti-BDS legislation to block said criticism on college campuses. It's also why Abby Martin is suing them. When a talk she was fully scheduled to give was canceled because she refused to toe the line, she tweeted, quote, After I was scheduled to give keynote speech at an upcoming Georgia Southern Conference, organizers said I must comply with Georgia's anti-BDS law and sign a contractual pledge to not boycott Israel. I refused, and my talk was canceled. The event fell apart after colleagues supported me. The organizers were afraid my pro-Palestine activism in the film Gaza Fights for Freedom would violate Georgia's anti-BDS law. Georgia is one of 27 states that passed legislation to criminalize BDS efforts. Ironically, the conference was centered around the notion of, quote, media literacy, unquote. The global awareness and success of BDS has terrified the political establishment, which has pursued an aggressive, bipartisan push to ban Israel boycotts across the U.S., especially at universities. Trump's recent executive order further cements this goal. The hyperbolic notion that conservatives are the ones being persecuted on college campuses has made blatant censorship campaigns against people for criticism of Israel or other progressive protests go completely ignored. Mara Verhayden Hillard, executive director of the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, had this to say, quote, Nonetheless, Filmmaker and journalist Abby Martin has now been barred by Georgia from contracting to speak on campus because she too advocates a boycott against apartheid, this time the apartheid enforced by the government of Israel against the Palestinian people. Government directives as to what political views a person may or may not advocate contravene fundamental First Amendment rights, are fatal to a free society, and must be struck down. Her attorneys at the Council for American Islamic Relations continued, There is no place where free speech is more important than on campus, 
and this attempt to suppress Abby's views, denying students, academics, and others from hearing her lecture, is as brazen as it is illegal. And in adopting this anti-BDS law, Georgia has prioritized the policy preferences of a foreign country over the free speech rights of Americans, like Abby, who speak on this state's college campuses. And who wouldn't love Israel? I mean, other than the people they displace, torture, and kill. Not like the Associated Press just released a report on Israel brutally torturing Palestinians. Wait, shit! That actually did happen. Link in the show notes. But censorship is good, actually. At least that's what Twitter says about Zero Hedge, anyway. Because they accuse them of, quote, doxing for posting public info about a scientist in one of their stories, and summarily scrubbed their account. They reported on a potential coronavirus lead, and because they used publicly available info, Twitter banned them for doxing. Sounds familiar. If this is the standard, I wonder why I'm still there after the Jocelyn Glaybach situation. For those who don't know, there's a link in the show notes. Not gonna go deep into it. But suffice it to say, dealing with shit like that was among the reason my podcast has been slow to return. But back on the subject. Yeah, alt media is under attack again. Facebook already banned Zero Hedge, and then New Zealand, the entire fucking country. And now Twitter joined in. From Zero Hedge, quote, What appears to have happened is that Twitter received a complaint from the website best known for publishing the discredited Steele dossier when no other media outlet would touch it and making cat slideshows, of course, BuzzFeed, in which someone called Ryan Broderick, who appears to have a rather colorful history, writes that Zero Hedge, quote, has released the personal information of a scientist from Wuhan, China, falsely accusing them of creating the coronavirus as a bioweapon, and a plot it said is the real-life version of the video game Resident Evil, unquote. Additionally, the guy behind the report in question admitted to being a pedophile and actually doxed people in the past, unlike Zero Hedge did. Quote, yet while Zero Hedge republished publicly available professional contact information for the Wuhan scientist, Broderick openly doxed the owners of Amy's baking company in 2013, tweeting a link to the private contact information of the husband and wife owners who made headlines for a controversial episode of Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. The information included their home address, phone numbers, email addresses, and a dossier covering the couple's marriage and financial history. Broderick is still on Twitter, as this is recorded. When I confronted him, little old me, Jeremiah Harding, about a tweet he posted endorsing the legalization of ephibophilia, which is a form of pedophilia, no matter how much they want to try to fucking soften it, he immediately deleted it within minutes without replying, but make no mistake, he still reps that set. If my Twitter is gone soon, you know why. So... I guess this is a good sig into COVID-19 or Wuhan flu or whatever they're calling it this week. It's a particularly aggressive version of the flu, which at the time of recording has already heavily disrupted global finance and claimed thousands of lives. By February 7th, it had already killed 724 people by decidedly conservative estimates, with almost 28,000 reported cases and almost 200,000 in observation. A week later, 1,367 were dead, and they were having, quote, errors, which they claim overreported some to make it look like 1,310 died in Hubei alone. But while they claim it's not as bad as it seems, they've also given themselves power to, quote, requisition houses, facilities, materials, etc. as an emergency epidemic prevention response when necessary. Unquote. Additionally, they're spraying whole cities with something they claim is a disinfectant, cities they locked down for fear of spreading. They're also going door-to-door dragging people to mandatory quarantine camps. While that's happening, local funeral homes are understaffed, reporting more than double the fatality rates the government is releasing. They also say the bodies are immediately sanitized and burnt as soon as they die, with no funeral or grief period and that funeral home workers are burning them around the clock, hardly sleeping. It's bad enough that the U.S. is quarantining too, 
blocking transports, and planning military bases for quarantine in Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Hawaii, Great Lakes Training Center, Navy Base, Illinois, Naval Air Station Joint Reserve Base, Fort Worth, Texas, Dobbins Air Force Base, Georgia, Fort Hamilton, New York, Naval Base Kitsap, Washington, Joint Base Anacosta Balling, Washington, D.C., Joint Base McGuire, Dix Lakehurst, New Jersey, and Fort Custer Training Center, Michigan. While that happens, Tencent, a leading Chinese app developer, had an error of their own. With a reported 154,023 confirmed cases and nearly 80,000 suspected, with 400,000 people in lockdown. And that was as of the 7th. If those numbers are true, it's dramatically more now, and nobody's being told. All of this led the author of the U.S. Bioweapons Act to claim this is a bioweapon, and led a U.S. senator to demand the Beijing government prove it isn't one. Talking about this possibility is what really got Zero Hedge banned. Official narratives only. With all that in mind, Chris Martinson said the world will feel the effects of the disease, and the organic prepper has posted a great nega list of all potentially affected items. Add to that, Michael Snyder has reported a shrunken world economy for the first time since 2009, and economists everywhere have depression on the breath. It's enough that even CNBC has tossed around the bioweapons idea. Now, if you're one of the people using this as an excuse to be xenophobic, jingoist, or otherwise racist, fuck you, you piece of shit. If this is a bioweapon, innocent people are being mass-murdered. If it's not, they're being affected by a disease they didn't ask for. Either way, they're suffering and dying, you steaming pile of garbage. But, if you're one of the millions legitimately concerned, I want you to know you're not alone. This is all weak old news at this point, and it was terrifying then. But the answer is calm resolve, no matter the reason, and good personal cleanliness, diet, and lifestyle habits. I wish you well on that. Sources for all of these claims in the show notes. So that brings us to the fuck the police section of the record. Let's start with a pig in Georgia who got arrested for having meth. From a press release, quote, On February 8th at around 8 p.m., Madison County Deputy Gabriel Dalton, 31 years of age, was arrested by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for possession of methamphetamines after a traffic stop by the Georgia State Patrol in Hull, Georgia. Dalton was off-duty and in his personal vehicle at the time. The arrest occurred after information was received by the Madison County Sheriff's Office, which was immediately turned over to the GBI for a fair and impartial investigation. Dalton was immediately terminated from employment by Sheriff Moore and booked into the Madison County Jail. After a bond hearing, Dalton was released on an $8,350 bond, and the case turned over to the Northern Judicial Circuit District Attorney's Office. There is no evidence at this time that there were any violations of Georgia law while Dalton was on duty with the Sheriff's Office. Uh-huh. Now, I'd not have a problem with this habit if he didn't work for the same government arresting people for it. People own themselves, and they have the right to dispose with their bodies as they please, but he violated other people's self-ownership on a regular basis. In this regard, so I wouldn't be upset with a life sentence. Piggy can rot. Similarly, but not the same, another cop broke the law and was arrested, only this time he wasn't doing something anyone has the right to do, as he was found to be actively producing and distributing child porn, and he was Trooper of the Year. From a press release, Manville, Louisiana, this morning a trooper with Louisiana State Police Troop L was taken into custody, charged with one count of production and distribution of pornography involving juveniles. The investigation was conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Louisiana State Police Special Victims Unit. The trooper, identified as 41-year-old Jason Boyette, has been placed on administrative leave following the arrest with all law enforcement property and gear recovered. The investigation began as special agents developed information of a subject, later identified as Boyette, producing and distributing pornographic images on a web-based application. Through investigative means, agents identified Boyette as the online user and placed him into custody following an interview. Boyette was booked into the Ta Tongi Pahoa, sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, Paris jail without incident. The investigation remains ongoing with the potential for additional charges. 
This investigation was made possible through the cooperation and coordination of the FBI New Orleans field office. Unquote. And another pig was arrested for groping seven little girls and asking for nudes. Seriously. From the Star Tribune, quote, reports by several students of, quote, inappropriate sexual contact initiated by Pelton prompted authorities to ask the Apple Valley Police Department to investigate. Students alleged that Pelton repeatedly initiated hugs from them during which he would touch their buttocks over their clothing. Most of these interactions occurred in Pelton's private school office, which lacked video surveillance. However, video was located that showed Pelton initiating hugs with female students in the halls. Several students also reported that Pelton would often call or refer to them as beautiful and sweetheart. One of them disclosed that he told her that if he were her age, he would date her. She also said that Pelton sent her Snapchat messages over summer break, and one of the messages he made lunch plans with her. Unquote. Now, for those of you who don't know, I have a YouTube, uh, Jeremiah Talks, feel free to go look that up. I have a series I'll be releasing on episode 2 of soon on more pedo cops, and there are enough that I could devote years to this subject alone. But when they're not filming kids fucking, trying to fuck kids or fucking kids, they're in schools brutalizing them. Quote, school resource officers are pigs who have a job working around your children, and it often attracts bullies who didn't pick on kids as much as they wanted to or got picked on and want to reverse roles without fighting someone their own size. This incident is certainly no exception as a cop lifted a child off the ground from behind by the neck, which he was choking at the time. Quote, On this date, at 8.50 a.m., I was notified by my staff that there had been an incident this morning at the Camden High School involving a Camden police officer. I was shown a video of Officer Jake Perry in an altercation with what appears to be a student. Officer Perry is assigned to the high school as a school resource officer. Effective immediately, Officer Perry has been relieved of duty pending an investigation. As the police chief... I will not tolerate misconduct from officers, and this matter will be dealt with, and I will be transparent in doing so. Unquote. And for your last reason to say fuck school cops, a little girl with ADHD and a mood disorder was kidnapped by school police and held in a psych facility for days while she was pumped full of antipsychotic drugs. All because she allegedly threw a chair, injuring nobody, and all without the permission or knowledge of her parents. From Jacksonville.com, quote, The body camera footage obtained by the Times Union captured the conversation between two responding officers. It also shows that at times the child's wrists with no handcuffs visible. The mother had previously said that the child was handcuffed, but the sheriff's office and school district said that wasn't true. Quote, I don't see her acting how she said. She's been actually very pleasant, a female sheriff's officer said to her male colleague. The Times Union requested the names of the responding officers from the sheriff's office. The male officer agreed, saying you poke the bear one too many times and it's going to scratch you. The female officer added that she thinks the six-year-old's outbursts were in reaction to school personnel pushing her buttons. She continued... Because they said this is the fourth or, or f out of five days she's been acting like this. Well then, I think the problem might be y'all. She's fine. There's nothing wrong with her. Unquote. Fucking damn these people. Don't like a kid? Just drug them. Rob their spirit. It doesn't matter. This is why I have rage. Nobody should have to grow up thinking this is normal. But hey, pigs have a solution for that too. Like the ones in South Carolina who ignored a pregnant inmate as she went into labor and waited in the other room as her baby unnecessarily died in a toilet. Yeah, that happened. I mean, some good-ish news here is that she got a settlement off it, but no amount of money can compensate for what amounts to the murder of a baby. Read Zanetra's story in the show notes. And while we're talking about what amounts to sexual abuse... I'd be remiss to not bring up that a ton of rape kits are being destroyed with no investigations. From Carrie Levin, 
Quote, even though Minnesota recently received a $2 million federal grant to DNA test the state's backlog of thousands of untested rape kits, a CARE 11 investigation has found that more than 220 kits will never be tested because they've already been destroyed. Overall, police agencies across the state destroyed more than 450 rape kits in unsolved and uncharged cases. Legal experts told CARE 11 it would be almost impossible to bring charges in a case involving a destroyed kit. You heard that right. 450 kits are gone, even though they took millions to process them. And it's worse than that, too. All these cases are worse, and for more in-depth reports, you can always head to jeremiahharding.com to find my sources. And I hope you do, because these sources lead to some wild stories, like a cop who won't face DUI penalties for being passed out in traffic at over five times the legal limit. From ABC, quote, Brockler said none of the eight Aurora police officers on scene told firefighters or EMS personnel that they had smelled alcohol. As a result, paramedics suspected Meyer might have been experiencing a stroke or suffering from opioid exposure. A DUI specialist dispatched to the hospital where Meyer was taken was told to stand down. Brockler said, quote, there was no attempt ever to seek Meyer's blood or begin a DUI investigation by Aurora police. Medical staff at the hospital he was taken to had drawn Meyer's blood and results indicated his blood alcohol level was five times over the legal limit. However, Brockler said he couldn't use the hospital's test results to prosecute Meyer for a DUI because of medical privacy and a law that prevents information compelled as part of an internal affairs report from being used by prosecutors. And that's not even to account... For the pig Jeff Buckles, guilty of threatening mass murder and terrorism, not charged once. I won't go into too much detail there. I made a whole video about that sack of shit already, and if you want to watch it, you're welcome to. Link in the show notes. But that's not all. The hellscape is hot, long, and wide, and I can't find all the demons on my own. If you want to make sure something is covered, DM me this story before this week's Friday, and I'll see about including it. If you want to support the show with PayPal or crypto or something, I'd definitely appreciate it. And if you want to subscribe to my Patreon or Subscribestar for $1 a month or more, you can help be a part of the solution that way. If a quarter of my followers did that, I'd make minimum wage for once. Thank you all. Because when they're not beating us, harming our young, censoring us, making us ill, or otherwise destroying our freedoms, the state loves to live in luxury while watching the proles suffer. And hey, just in time for all this, they quote, lost $35 trillion. I'm sure it's legitimately gone and didn't just go to stuff they'd rather we not know about. Sarcasm aside, if you're still here, thank you. Time to make JeremiahHarding.com great again. There are demons to hunt.